All right, thanks for coming. My name is Stuart Roach. Um, I'm currently an intern at Eastern Michigan University, and uh, also in the Department of uh, Orthopedic Research at the University of Michigan. Uh, today, I'd like to spend about um, 12 to 15 minutes talking about uh, monitoring and reporting recovery uh, in, the, in the collegiate athlete. Okay, so first up, presentation outline. Uh, Briefly cover stress, uh, the response to stress, and what we're trying to achieve from it, which is adaptation, and hopefully improvement in sporting performance. Um, then we'll look at the methods for, for monitoring and reporting recovery, uh, what kind of methods are uh, have been around for a while, what's new and coming onto the scene, and uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion later on about that. So in those methods, uh, there'll be two areas, the perceptual measures, and secondly, the kind of physiological measures as well. And like I say, at the end, we'll have a discussion about those kind of things and um, what we think. Okay. So first up, stress and adaptation. Obviously, when we're training, we're trying to provide an overload to the body. The body is not used to, uh, and we'll call this generically a stress. Uh, in general, in training, we want to have an adaptation that is greater than our stress. So, so for example, if we administer our training dose, whatever it may be, it's overloading the body. It's not used to that kind of load. It fatigues, and through appropriate recovery, we achieve a higher level okay, of performance. And hopefully, you know, this kind of super compensation period will start to work in periodization here to hopefully reach higher and higher heights by progressively overloading the body in a similar way. However, if we don't allow ourselves sufficient recovery, or we're training too hard in short spaces of time, or our recovery isn't optimal, we can get non functional overreaching, in which case, our performance does not improve and in fact, in fact goes down. Now over time, if we don't allow recovery, um, and we don't have the right recovery methods in between, then over time we could get this kind of chronic state, um, which some may term uh, being overtrained or under-recovered. And this is something we really want to try and avoid. So recovery is obviously very important. All right, so talking about the, the methods for, for monitoring current recovery, we're not actually going to talk about you know, how best to recover today, really just looking at the methods that people are using to, to monitor it. So we'll start off with our, our perceptual measures. Slide. Good, all right, so uh, various, very obvious ones are questionnaires. Um, they're very easy to do. They're very easy to do. Uh, they're cost effective in the multiple times a week, and you can get decent information from them. So one of them, for example, would be a profile of mood states. Um, and in general, we're just looking at how the athlete is during that week in terms of their um, kind of psychometric analysis, you know, looking at vigor, looking at fatigue. Are they depressed? Are they angry? Do they have tension? Okay, so we're looking for, ideally, high vigor in the middle, in the middle and lower fatigues on the outside, and tension and anxiety on the outside. So these are very easy to administer. Next slide. And we also have um, DAL, DA, daily uh, activities. I can't remember what it stands for. Um, basically, the kind of daily activities that we're, that we're involved in as, as athletes. Uh, very easy to work with. So A, B, C, worse than normal. B is normal in the middle, and C is better than normal. So again, very easy kind of way to assess where the athlete is on a, on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Um, now, it's important with questionnaires, obviously, some people might think, well, with a questionnaire, maybe an athlete is going to really hide what they're, what they're feeling because either they want to be selected, they want to train harder than the person that's next to them, okay, that kind of thing. But I think it's important that we educate the athletes on the purpose of the questionnaire and that we're trying to keep them safe and we're trying to progressively overload them so they give us accurate answers so that we can help them in turn. So, so hopefully as well with these questionnaires, it's a bit more kind of qualitative information. It's about how you're feeling. Okay, it might open up more discussion between the coach and the athlete. And that's what's really important, and we can't forget that, especially in recovery, is that speaking to the athlete is probably one of the best ways to gauge where they're at. You know, how you're feeling, how's, how's class going? Ask questions that don't necessarily relate to performance in particular. You know, not, saying, not necessarily saying, are you sore? But saying something else to try and uh, tease out those finer details of how, how, how they feel in general, in daily life. Okay, so that's just a couple of perceptual measures. It's surely not an exhaustive list, um, but it's a few of the more common ones. Now to physiological measures. Spend a bit more time on this one. Okay, so um, obviously science has progressed quite a lot um, in, the, in the last 20, 30 years. 
Um, but really, things like force plates have been around for a long, 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 long time. Okay? But it's only really just starting to get into the collegiate setting. It's involved in the Olympic training centers, sports science research facilities, but in the collegiate setting, they're only just beginning to appear. So Kansas, for example, and uh, Andrea Hudi, there uses a very simple uh, jump test at the beginning of, uh, of workouts to try and look at uh, reactive strength index, re rate of force development into the plate so that she can really assess uh, what kind of levels these guys are at in terms of their recovery. And they're paired up with Sparta Sports Science, so it's a, it's a great setup they've got there. So yeah, just an example, a uh, laptop at the front showing their rate of force development into the ground. So that's just a, a very simple counter movement jump on the force plate. Uh, we can also look at, like I said, reactive strength index when we're dropping off a box, looking at the time spent on the ground, the ability to uh, decelerate the body and re-accelerate the body. So looking at the uh, neuromuscular system and seeing how fatigued or fired up it is. So this is going to give us a good measure. And this can get quite in depth. There's a lot of measures we can look at here. Um, but it's, it's important not to get too caught up in the data and not to draw too many conclusions from just one set, uh, one set of testing. Uh, next thing I'd like to spend some time on here is a little bit more recent uh, coming to the I suppose say heart rate, my apologies. Heart rate variability. Um, this has been around since about the 1950s. Uh, it's actually been um, more so used in training uh, cosmonauts. The Russians came up with this kind of principle. Basically, click a few times there. Basically, you have, that's good, between your um, QRS waves of your, of your heartbeat, you have a period of rest in between each heartbeat. Now, these are actually variable. It's not completely consistent all the time. So this gives us a bit of a measure of our, our autonomic nervous system. And it, it can actually be very useful when we're looking at recovery. So, uh, two, two more times. So one of the, uh, one of the companies that's come out uh, more recently uh, is one called Bioforce. I'll talk about two of them. Uh, one called Bioforce HRV. Uh, this is just a picture of their screen. All right, so what they're looking at, let me click is this is a HRV measurement. Typically, it ranges from 0 to 100. So it measures the, the, uh, the differences between the respirators, between the QRS complexes. And then through an algorithm, sorry, just go back one. Through an algorithm, it'll bump out the number between 0 and 100. 0 represents, theoretically, the more sympathetic end of the spectrum. And 100 represents the more parasympathetic, parasympathetic end of the spectrum. Now, ideally, in recovery, we want this number to be higher, we want to be close to parasympathetic, this is better for rest, recovery, whereas sympathetic is more uh, epinephrine, adrenaline if you want, um, and so here we might be more stressed out, more under-recovered, not quite ready for exercise. So uh, on this app as well, they have daily, weekly, and monthly changes, so obviously you're not just looking at oh, what am I like on one day, we're looking at daily, month, weekly, and monthly, one more click. So we have uh, color coded green, amber, and red to kind of show where is the athlete um, in, in terms of daily change from their previous couple of days. Now, this is done via a, a heart rate monitor, obviously, uh, very simple to use, connects via Bluetooth with the, with the phone or the iPad or wherever it might be. And you can get good, uh, good quick information there. It only takes about um, five minutes to actually do this. Next up. So I have graph, graphical representations down here at the bottom too, so you can really look at over time what is happening, where are my peaks, where are my troughs, what happened during that training week, what happened in my personal life during that time, and we can start to kind of figure out, okay, what are the best strategies for me as an individual to try and recover, uh, recover the best and try and approach that more parasympathetic end of the spectrum. You know, when I do this test, when I wake up in the morning, I spend five minutes just figuring out where I'm at. Yep, keep going. Good. All right, so uh, in Bioforce, data extraction, unfortunately, a um, couple more clicks. That was a little bit more difficult, okay? It's just sent via Excel spreadsheet and pumped out. So we can actually only, one more click, we can actually only use this with individuals. Okay, unfortunately, their system right now doesn't compile the information from the team and pump it into a, an online database or on the cloud or anything like that. So unfortunately, it's just used with individuals, so it'd be quite a lot of work to get if you're having a team setting, get a lot of people doing this in the morning and being compliant and having to send in an email or Excel spreadsheet of their results for that morning and then have somebody on the uh, strength conditioning staff compile that and go through it and make sure the data is, is there and correct. So uh, that's a bit of a, a drawback to the Bioforce system. Next one. 
next up. However, uh, Omega Wave, uh, which is a bit more prevalent in this area, again, it's HRV. Um, they tend to be a bit more of the team setting. So they have a couple more things that they measure. They measure the HRV and they also me measure um, DC, uh, which is looking at uh, brain activity, um, feeding down to the brain, again, through the kind of uh, autonomic nervous system. So app looks a little bit more sexy than the previous one, a um, little bit more to play around with. But in general, it measures roughly the same things. Um, it has a, a bit of a nice interface, you use it on your iPad, and it gives you again this kind of similar graphical representation with color coding as to how well recovered we are. On that scale it's 1 through 7, uh, 7 being the best recovery, 1 being uh, in the worst state possible. Okay, so again we can see, we can select different points in time and figure out uh, where we're at according to, for example, cardiac readiness. Next slide. Uh, central nervous system. Next slide. Metabolic system. Next slide and then it gives you an overall readiness. Um, now I'm a little bit skeptical as to uh, how the system works out, uh, these various things. Uh, the autonomic nervous system is obviously mainly figured out by the heartbeat, also it has the DC, uh, DC current, uh, but I'm, I'm no expert on that, um, so I'll have to give you some recommended reading at the end. It gives you a general, this thing called wet windows of trainability. So it says which of your systems are more able to be uh, adapted at that current point in time according to your level of recovery. So again, they color code this, green, yellow, or amber, and then I'll have red further down at the bottom. The higher these kind of balloons are, the better able you are to adapt from a certain kind of battle training of that type. So you've got endurance, speed, power, strength, coordination, skill. And you really have to see you know, how do they define those areas to figure out what they mean. Next up. Uh, like I said, it has a bit, of, a bit of a better team view to it, so you can get everyone's uh, results in on a cloud system pretty much uh, straight away as soon as they submit. Um, it's an automatic thing, on the uh, automatic feature of the app. And you can see, you know, just in general, how well recovered they are according to these various things. Um, and again, it will ask you about your sleep and various other uh, aspects of uh, recovery. If you don't have about $30,000 to spend on a mega wave, which also has a subscription fee too, um, you might think of something a little bit more reasonable. Um, uh, so this is a Dave Joyce uh, used to be the Western Force uh, in Australia. Uh, he uses a 100 point scale of recovery, which I think is a great idea. It really gives ownership to the athlete as to their recovery. Um, next up, so it has a menu of choices. Right? So for example, one person, um, one person may love a massage after a training session, um, whereas another person might not like massages. They might actually spike cortisol, um, you know, it might get them a little bit more uh, more angry <laughs> during the day because of, oh, I have to go and do this mass, I've got to make time for something I don't want to do. So it's a menu of choices on a point system. So for example, nine hours of sleep would be 25 points. Um, returning to pre-match weight would be 25 points. So it has all these kind of uh, variety of choices which you can make up your 100 points with. Interestingly, it also has uh, added bonus for social recovery. So um, there's research out that suggests that if you do recovery with a teammate or a friend or whoever, that the uh, release of um, happy hormones um, will help aid your recovery as well. So you get more points if you're doing it with a, with a friend or a buddy rather than just by yourself. So the real question I, I kind of have with this is, it's, great, it's all great information and it really helps us to see where the athlete is at, especially with those kind of questionnaires and the qualitative aspect. Again, to build that relationship with them and uh, build that trust too. But the thing is, click there. You know, if the app says, oh, this person is you know, under recovered for this certain, whatever they term speed, skill, strength, or whatever it is, you know, are you going to say, ah, sorry, you're not ready, you're going to have to come back in two hours, and we'll make a window for you then, maybe we'll test you again, see where you're at. You know, so it's great information, but I don't think we should really, you know, have a, a one-size-fits-all approach to this. If it says not ready to not ready to train, maybe the athlete is ready to train. Also, think about the team dynamic. Maybe there's people who want to. There's people competing for positions. If you send them away and say, uh, "I don't think you're recovered yet," but really, you know, they feel like they're ready to go. Maybe that session will actually help pick them back up psychologically, and maybe that's going to be a benefit to them. So, I believe it's a useful tool. Um, you know, not necessarily just a mega wave, but all these other. Uh, methods of monitoring recovery. They're useful tools, but we've really got to think, uh, to think about the large picture here too. Fine. 
I cook three times there. So these are these are kind of my questions that I've been thinking about over the last week. You know, how are these technologies best used? Are they best used in the in the, in the team or the individual setting? Um, what is more appropriate, whether it's the, the psychometric test um, or the more physiological testing? Um, and again, like we kind of just talked about, would you let these values inform your training on a day-to-day -day basis, and how how much influence would they have? So uh, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Mm -hmm.